What if, what if we had that attitude? What would this church look like? How would this community be affected if we were those kinds of bond servants? There's no other place to be except here serving Christ. That's something else that I saw in this team, including Pastor Albert, when we were over in Nepal. And of course, demonstrating the spirit and the power of God. So it's time for us to get serious. We need to stop playing church and start being the church. What do I mean by that? We need to stop putting on this Christian facade. We need to stop coming here once a week and saying, okay, check mark, I did my Christian duty this week. I went to church. Woo! Bless me, God, because I did it. Okay? I know a lot of you don't have that attitude, but there are people who do, right? But what if all of us had this idea that we're not going to be playing church anymore, that we commit ourselves with complete abandon to the crazy love of God, knowing full well that he's not going to hurt us in anything. We can release everything to him without failure, without fear, and he won't do anything that would hurt us in return. You know, he says, uh, Jesus says in Matthew 16, verse 18, the latter half of that verse, he says, and the gates of hell will not prevail against it referring to the church. The gates of hell, the gates of Hades, those things which are set up as a defense, they're not going to prevail. What does that make the church? We're on the offensive when it comes to evil things. We are the ones who are out there doing the job. The spiritual warfare is something that we take seriously. And the gates of hell, there's nothing that the evil forces have that would hold us back. That's what this says. Could you imagine this church being on fire for God like that to where the gates of hell will not prevent this church from doing what it needs to do. We need to be the hands and feet of Christ. When Pastor Albert and the rest of the team were there, it was the most incredible thing to watch because we flew in on April, uh, April 23rd. We had one day of rest on the 24th from the jet lag. On the 25th, we were up at about 5.30 or 5 o'clock, caught the van to go down to Nepal Gunge, which was part of our trip. Our initial idea with the trip was to go, uh, actually do a nationwide sweep. I wanted these pastors to meet our na national partners. I wanted them to meet our missionaries that we're supporting over there. I wanted them to meet the people that they work with and their networks. I wanted these guys to be able to uh, preach and do conferences that would build up the leadership of these networks. And so we were going to Nepal Gunge, which is like a 10 or 12 hour drive, depending on the day, the traffic and the roads, right? And so 10 to 12 hours, and we're eight hours down that road already, and we're sitting there eating at a roadside cafe, and all of a sudden, everything starts to shake. Now, I'm an oblivious Colorado, all right? I'm like sitting there eating and bouncing and eating and bouncing, and I'm thinking trucks are driving by or something, right? And everybody's running out, and all of a sudden I hear in English, it's an earthquake, it's an earthquake, and I know it's, okay, I'll leave too, and I grab my last moment when I left. So I was out there standing outside, and these rocks are coming down, and I'm thinking, okay, I was a tremor. I was kind of cool. I'd never been in an earthquake before. It was just a small thing where we were. But all of a sudden, we get a phone call from Nancy, who's uh, our missionary's wife, and she says, hey, we just had a really big earthquake here. He says, well, call me back. Let me know how the conditions are. Okay, so he knew that his family was at least safe. So we drove for another 45 minutes down the road, and all of a sudden, you know, we try calling back. The circuits are busy, various other things. We start praying about the situation because that's really odd. And so 45 minutes later, we get another call. We finally get through, and we find out, oh, man, there's hundreds of buildings that have been destroyed. There's hundreds of people that have been dead, that are dead. Reports are coming in that it could well be into the thousands or tens of thousands of deaths nationwide. And Nancy says to Rick, we need to come home. So we spun the van around, and we drove another 10 hours going back because we got stuck in traffic. It was like a parking lot on the pass uh, because there was slides that had come down across the road. And the road crew consisted of a one um, uh, kind of big tractor <laughs> thing, okay? And they were finally able to clear the road. And then we, as we crested over the pass and coming down into Kathmandu again, immediately we recognized the devastation that had taken place. Buildings that were there only a few hours earlier were now laying flat on the ground. People were out in the streets. People were crying. And everywhere that we went, we saw clouds of dust and smoke and various other things. And we knew things were really bad. So we got back to our guest house where we were supposed to stay that evening, and the guest house was closed. It was locked. Nobody could go in or out. We were, had nothing but the clothes on our back and a few things that were in our backpacks. And so we thought, you know, we don't have a place to stay. I don't have anything to sleep outside in, so what are we going to do? 
And so Rick, our missionary, suggested, because he had to go take care of his family, he said, go down a few, few blocks, see if that uh, guest house down there has room for you. And so that's what we did. And when we got there, they said, yes, we have room, but we're concerned that the building may not be safe, so you guys are going to have to sleep outside. And so we did for those first couple of nights. And so uh, Pastor Albert and the rest of the team, we uh, were taken care of very well by the staff of the guest house. We were given blankets and tarp and pillows and all sorts of stuff. And the tremors kept going on that evening. It rained on us, so we had to move from where we were, go find a roof to, to be under. So we ended up on a slab with this metal roof overhang. It was next to like a three or four-story building, so we moved far enough away so that four, four-story building didn't come crashing down on us in the middle of the night. And it was one of those nights right there at the beginning where that uh, 6.9 aftershock hit us. And the only thing that I can do to explain it, even though I've never ridden a rhino before, that's what it felt like. So it's like riding a rhino. I just got tossed back and forth and all around. And I've seen plenty of rodeos. I've never ridden a bull, but it was really close. So this was the only thing that I can say that might explain that. But this team was the hands and feet of Christ. All the agenda that we had was thrown to the side. Day by day, moment by moment, prayerfully, we simply said, Lord, we're at your disposal. Where do you want us to go? So they roughed it, they preached, they taught, they were encouraging, they shared the gospel, they prayed, they distributed Bibles. We had 100 to 150 people, Nepalis, that were in the same field, in their tents and in their, under their tarps and all of that. And these guys had a case of Bibles, 36 of them, that uh, they began just giving out to anybody who was interested. They didn't force the issue, they didn't do anything. They simply sat down, began reading it. Curiosity got the best of some of those Nepalis. They said, here, would you like one? And we had gone through and we uh, yellow marked some of the most important passages of scripture like Romans Road and chapter 10 of John and a few of these other passages, right? And then we passed them out and I noticed in, underneath this one tarp that this young man in his teens, I would guess, and his family were in there and he was sitting there reading the Bible. And so I walked over there and I said, excuse me, do you speak English? And he said, yes. I said, do you know what you're reading? I kind of felt like Philip in the Ethiopian eunuch. And I said, yeah, dost thou understand what thou readest? You know, and, and so, sorry, that was King James if you don't understand it. Um, <laughs> So he opened the Bible, and he says, no, I don't really understand. I said, can I explain it to you? And he said, sure. And for the next two and a half hours, we expanded from Genesis through Revelation what God's plan was. And they had lots of really cool questions. They didn't come to know the Lord right then and there, but I have no doubt with the word of God in their hand at some point they will. Because that's how God works. We were simply planting seeds that day. And then we ended up giving away two cases, 72 Bibles while we were over beautiful to see the hands and feet of Christ at work. And of course, these guys also followed suit. They were witnessing to people right, left, and center. So I want to close this up real quick. Ephesians chapter 4, verses 1 through 3, we need to be, we need to be serious about our walk with Christ. We need to take our being the body of Christ seriously. Paul speaking here, he says, I therefore, the prisoner of the Lord, there's that phrase, I beg you to walk worthy of your calling with which you are called with all lowliness and gentleness and long-suffering, bearing with one another in love, endeavoring to keep the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. Take four Baptist pastors, stick them in one room, and it's a recipe for trouble, except when they're spiritually mature. It didn't matter what the personal issues were. We simply said, we're here to serve. And these guys absolutely blessed my heart because they quoted this passage. We need to endeavor to keep the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. So it didn't matter what we looked like in the morning with our hair all messed up. Okay? It didn't matter whether or not we liked the Nepali food or not. It didn't matter. We were there to serve. That was a beautiful, mature attitude. Verse 4 through 6 in the same chapter, Therefore, or there is one body and one Spirit, just as you were called in one hope of your calling. One Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is above all and through all and in you all. And so with this, we have to understand that we are bonded together by the Spirit of God. We have a mission and a purpose that should supersede every personal agenda out there. If we're doing what Christ wants us to do, even though we are busy, it's a four-letter word, but we're busy, it's okay. We do it anyway. These men left their ministries. They left their families. They left the things that they held to be responsible for back in the States and spent almost two weeks with me over there. 
doing those things and God shook up the, the whole agenda. We had to throw it away and start all over day by day. And yet it was a maturing, beautiful process. Verse 7, therefore submit to God, resist the devil, and he will flee from you. Draw near to God, and he will draw near to you. Cleanse your hands, you sinners, and purify your hearts, you double-minded. James is speaking from chapter 4 here, and he's saying that we need to rethink how we do church. Instead of coming to church, we need to be the church. And the, the responsibility is, is for us to draw near to God, and he will draw near to us. If we resist the devil, if we resist the flesh, if we resist those things which are our dreams, and we simply submit them to Christ, then God draws near to us. The double-minded portion there is important for us to understand because basically it means double focus. So a lot of us have our heads into the world, and then a lot of us have our heads into our responsibilities with Christ. And what happens with most of us is, after we leave on Sunday, our heads are back into the world. We're there six more days during the week, and then, oh, it's Sunday. Okay, let's go do this one. Oh, now it's back to Monday again. See, double-minded. It's a, it's a displaced focus. That's not what the Lord's asking us to do. Verse 9 in the same chapter, Lament and mourn and weep. Let your laughter be turned to mourning and your joy to gloom. Humble yourselves in the sight of the Lord, and he will lift you so why all this dark language? Why do we have to go there? I'm in, a, I'm in a good place with the Lord. I'm happy. I'm joyful. But James is saying, no, rethink it. Rethink it. Let that joy turn to humility. Really seek the Lord just like we had to do in Nepal. Shaken up. Put into a national crisis. Our agenda is completely thrown out the window. And all we had to do is day by day depend on the Lord. What are we going to do with, you, with this day, Lord? What would you have us to do? And you know the beautiful thing about that is he always helps you live up to your responsibilities. It doesn't matter if it's your family or whatever your responsibilities are, your job. It doesn't make any difference. He helps, helps you live up to those responsibilities and do those things which are in his will. You see, nobody's asking you to be irresponsible towards those things in your own life. What the Bible is saying, though, is recheck it. Make sure, recalibrate where you are. Think about being the church instead of coming to church. So if we're going to get serious, we need to humble ourselves. We need to put away that pride. We need to draw near to God. We need to set our agenda aside. We need to see a need, and we need to meet that need. And then we need to get in the race. We need to walk worthy. We need to stop sitting on the sidelines. And so at the end of all of this for today, I'm going to leave you with only one question, one thing to ponder. And I would ask that you ponder this prayerfully. In other words, pray as you're thinking about it, okay? Lord, what is church to me? And see if he doesn't realign some priorities in your life. See if there's not some things that might change in your life. Because I guarantee you, it's going to be better. Because God works all things together for the good, doesn't he? So what are we afraid of? What are we afraid of letting go? Church, what is it to you? And so what I'd like to end with is a short, about an eight-minute video of the trip over there. And I hope that it's a demonstration of what I'm talking about today, where the agendas were set aside, and because of the situation that was before us, we simply moved forward and did those things which God would have us to do day by day which, quite frankly, we were doing that anyway. And I told these guys before we went over there, I said, you've got to be prepared for anything. I said, all agendas get thrown out the window every time we go on one of these trips. But you have to be prepared to wing it. And so I'd like to leave that with you. Be prepared to wing it. Look for those godly interruptions, and don't put them to the side. It might be a grandchild. It might be somebody who comes into your life that needs the Lord. It may be somebody who's just having a bad day and could simply encourage them. But let those godly interruptions change your life. It's a beautiful thing. So let's go ahead and uh, cue up that movie.